Using this material, you will see how I overthrow the Polish same to introduce absolute Polish democracy, meaning an absolute monarchy. This won't be an easy or quick journey, as I'll have to take away the nobility's golden freedoms. As a bonus in this episode, I'll show you how to prepare Poland to conquer the world. Yes, I know you want this. Hello, imperialist, this is Lucas. Unfortunately, Poland is initially without a king, so I had a few years of peace. I satisfied the social states with certain privileges, but I had to be careful with the nobility. I couldn't give them too many privileges or they would become too powerful, especially since I plan to show the magnates their place later. So, I went down the path of rejecting the Nyej Sawa privileges, I also left room for a negative privilege that we'll receive in about 20 years. I'll show you when it appears. I'm also debating in parliament about returning crown lands to the ruler, but the deputies are not yet favorable. I also completed a mission for the nobility to get a cheaper advisor. Our court focuses on military actions. Yes, I plan to form a union with Lithuania, as I have no other choice. The first step to introducing an absolute monarchy in our country is to get rid of the Sejm. I also formed a strategic alliance with the Duke of Burgundy. I'm also planning to change our faith to orthodoxy. It will be the best religion for what I plan for this country. Orthodox revolts are best provoked in Lviv. Since I eliminated the church fund, the clergy won't contribute to this task. Next, I formed an alliance with Bohemia and a third alliance with Moldavia, which immediately became a Polish march. A great success. Then I carried out a mission because I preferred to have a Moldavian vassal. I also gained many claims to Wallachia, which we will soon attack. Sometime later, the parliament surrendered land to me. I achieved a great political success by convincing a deputy from Krakow. Here's an interesting fact about Moldavia and its missions. If Moldavia were still your ally and you attack the Ottoman Empire with them, capturing Edirne for Moldavia, they could complete the Imapolda Sultan mission. Yes, Mehmed wouldn't survive that. However, during this game, I had some bad luck. For now, I'm using my diplomats to improve relations with Mazovia and Bohemia to quickly gain 100 trust points with them. This time, the nobility quickly agreed on Władysław III's succession. Unfortunately, this event has been weakened, as we can no longer gain three unions at once, only a maximum of two, Bohemia or Hungary. A tough choice, but only the union with Lithuania gave me the elective monarchy I needed to later cause a civil war, blah blah blah, I trust the sagem. And so from that moment, I enjoyed a new form of government, the elective monarchy, and thus in three months my country became the second most powerful in the world, therefore I attacked... <clears throat> I attacked Wallachia and remembering this time marked in my political interests that I want the province of Kuln. I always forget that. Always. We'll need this during a certain event. I quickly conquered Wallachia but didn't transfer the newly conquered territories to Moldavia since they are all orthodox. Speaking of orthodox revolts, they're about to erupt. So I sold all the crown land and haven't reclaimed it yet. I provoked the rebels and importantly instructed my vassals to stay away. Orthodox zealots quickly occupied Krakow, making orthodoxy the dominant religion. After the rebellion, I reclaimed the land for the crown and transferred Wallachia's territories to Moldavia. Then I recruited a mercenary army to reach the force limit, but had some bad luck as I didn't have a good siege commander. Having alliances and an army, my next step was to settle scores with Hungary. As it was their fault, I declared war on Hungary to seize their throne, intentionally leaving the Czechs out of this conflict. I first attacked Austria to quickly capture Vienna, forcing the German emperor to pay war reparations. Then I directed my troops towards Hungary, calling the Czechs into the the war only after capturing the gold mines. I believe there's a mechanic where the Czechs incur less aggressive expansion when they are my ally in this war. At least I think so. I ended the war with Hungary by capturing two Slovak provinces, especially the gold mines, gaining a lot of money and most importantly securing the Hungarian throne for the Polish king. The world didn't care about Hungary's fate thanks partly to my spies, as a larger spy network in a country reduces the aggressive expansion from our conquests, but my conquests didn't end there. I attacked Bosnia, waiting briefly for Hungary to clear Croatia. That's the thing. Of course, if Bosnia wasn't my real target, I actually wanted Kosovo's gold miners. After weakening Austria, the Palatinati became the new emperor. This game did it on purpose because it knew I couldn't pronounce the new emperor's name correctly. The world showed more interest in the fate of the Serbs than the Hungarians. I was also lucky to complete a mission for a cheaper inquisitor, making province conversion cheaper. I sent the inquisitor first to the gold provinces. We can't have gold in the hands 
hands of heretics. My first government reform was to increase taxes, which Poles love. In the year 59, I was lucky because the Duke of Burgundy died and Poland inherited Burgundy. Unfortunately, this meant war with the new German emperor. From that moment on, France became my new arch enemy. Soon after, I supported the Prussian Confederation in the fight for a free Gdansk. I also refused the German emperor's demand to relinquish Burgundy, really? Fortunately, my Czech ally decided to help me in these wars. Unfortunately, Poland's greatest enemy, the Polish nobility, struck. They demanded certain privileges, but I had to refuse them. I didn't have to, but it's better for the long run. I ended the war with the Teutonic Order and it ceased to exist. I converted the German emperor to orthodoxy because I couldn't pronounce his name. He wasn't the only country I converted. After all my conquests and pursuit of greatness, many countries declared me a rival on the international stage. It was also the right time to use an icon to reduce the costs of building construction and province development. The coming years will be a period of significant expansion, especially since we have two gold mines to develop. I've also managed to enhance our country's diplomatic reputation, which should help us gain a union over Bohemia. Thanks to this mission, I have gained significant trust from the Bohemians and have good relations with them. They recently stopped demanding my land for some reason. I've successfully formed a union over Bohemia, at the first attempt of course. I decided to wait before making Gdansk our vassal, doing it after annexing Moldavia. Despite the absence of a Czech king, there's still a claimant to the Polish throne, but I need a weaker ruler, maybe someone from Brandenburg or Volgost. I've achieved the required level of world splendor and used it to reduce aggressive expansion in all my future future wars. I've also formed a temporary alliance with the Mamluk Sultanate, which I'll use in the upcoming war with the Ottoman Empire. Returning to the topic of developing Poland, this is when we'll attract foreign capital for this purpose. I had to send my troops to collect the cash since bank transfers haven't been invented yet. I chose the first ideas for Poland and can't imagine playing without aristocratic ideas. They're too good. Are you curious about what I will choose next? You'll see later. I've entered lucrative investment agreements with the Muscovites and burned down their capital as a reminder to keep their word. I heard that one must be tough with the Russians. In 1486, Moldavia became an integral part of Poland, so I carried out a mission for the Prussian Confederation, ensuring Poland had sea access. I could have done it earlier, but with two gold mines, I didn't need Baltic trade so urgently. Upon reaching the seventh level of military technology, it was time to prepare for war with the Ottoman Empire. First, I expanded my army, and second, I chose religious ideas for Poland. I aimed to accumulate human resource bonuses provided by religious aristocratic ideas and orthodoxy itself. An additional benefit was one of the best casus belli in the game. Meanwhile, I also expanded Krakow, but it wasn't yet the right time to introduce the Polish Renaissance. I had more work for the Inquisitor. I managed to reform our bureaucracy, allowing me to establish higher taxes, 50% higher in all provinces. Thus prepared, I attacked the Ottoman Empire at an opportune moment, when their allies refused to join the war, and I had a fourfold advantage over their army. Surprisingly, we were ahead militarily even though Mehmed was still alive. This war demonstrates the importance of not neglecting military technology to develop an idea. The war went as planned, with the Ottoman army being strategically distracted by the Mamluks in Greece for some reason. I fought the most important battle under Kosovo, where all forces were committed. I won but at a high cost. The Burgundian army fared better. Unfortunately, the Ottoman army moved against the Mamluk Sultanate. I used this moment to capture the heavily fortified Caucasian fortresses. Really. They surrendered. As a result of this war, I gained several provinces, bordering Constantinople and a significant amount of foreign capital. Introducing the Polish Renaissance was worthwhile, as we acquired Nicolaus Copernicus, who works almost for free, those Poles. Our seasoned troops from the Ottoman conflict were then sent to Moscow to acquire additional capital. The spoils were spent on barracks for a mission. In theory, every province in Poland will develop one military point. Considering this, I pondered whether to wait with this mission until forming the Commonwealth. How do you do that? Because currently I have 459. Click 508. Although I could more effectively demonstrate how this affected my human resources, I previously had about 600, so I guess it was worth it. Quite a lot for those years. I also converted all my subjects to orthodoxy, surprisingly maintaining their loyalty. Since missionaries in Poland had nothing to do, I sent them abroad. The nobility demanded more privileges, which I calmly rejected. In 1494, I sent my troops to conquer Constantinople and empty the Ottoman coffers. I used the icon of St. Michael to strengthen my army, facing numerous battles without the Mamluk Sultanate's support. Meanwhile, I found a suitable candidate for the Polish throne, needed to overthrow the elective monarchy. True to 
Polish tradition, a rebellion broke out during the Tough War, both in Poland and Hungary. The Pacta Conventa and Henrician articles were crucial. From that point, my power depended heavily on the Sejm's decisions. I had to grant a privilege that weakened my country, but it was necessary for a hidden modifier required for a civil war in 1615, leading to absolute monarchy. Probably... Great, the same supported my policy because it could also oppose it. Yes, and only from this moment can I undertake this mission. If I had done it earlier, I wouldn't have been able to have the Henrician articles, and without them, I couldn't have a civil war. What don't you understand? I sent my ruler to lead our armies. Then there's a greater chance he'll die, as he's a weak ruler. Let him lead. It seems the Ottoman Empire is facing hard times. I feel a bit guilty, but it made conquering Constantinople easier, and soon after, I put the magnets in their place. They didn't like it, of course. Luckily, my army armies seasoned in battle easily handle these rebels. Of course, I wouldn't be myself if I didn't mess something up. I forgot that Byzantium can't be released from Constantinople. And most importantly, after weakening the magnates, we can freely grant and revoke privileges, which I used to maximize mercantilism. I also got rid of excess crown land. After wars with Poland, the Ottoman Empire plunged into total chaos and bankruptcy during the third investment raid on Moscow. I also acquired Livonia and later transferred it to Lithuania, shielding Poland from the Muscovite wilderness. By 1515, Poland's economy and army are quite impressive. I have a bit too much, but I can afford it. Yes, I have a steady flow of foreign investment. Fortunately, after a very short reign, our mediocre ruler dies. Although that probably didn't solve my problem for long. The same supported me again, since the Ottoman Empire was experiencing one civil war after another. I decided to visit them. Oh Persia, the Ottoman army chose not to fight us and literally disbanded. A pro-Protestant reformation also broke out. It could have happened a bit faster, because for Poland, the next era is much better. No Ottoman army was found, and since there was no army, you know, carpet siege, Moscow probably shared the fate of the Ottoman Empire. Disbanding the army turned out to be a really good tactic. After all, I can't win any battle against the Ottoman Empire if they don't have an army. So I don't achieve the war goal. The war with the Ottoman Empire ends with me acquiring several key territories, and most importantly, money for further investments. Then I immediately struck at Karaman. After overthrowing the Magnites, I focused the government's efforts on reforming my country. Poland without cooperation with the same is really hopeless. That's what happens when the same and the head of state argue with each other. 500 years and nothing has changed in this country. Our troops reach Jerusalem to visit the holy city, but it's not yet the moment we conquer it, although we will aim for it very soon. This monument would be very useful to us. Cairo, Alexandria, our Egypt. Here we bring a lot of treasures. Since a pretty good new ruler ascended to the throne very quickly after the previous war, now we need to carry out a few reforms in our government. I predict that the Ottoman Empire will be dismantled, as it is under full occupation. In all these conquests, a Polish golden age Age has dawned, not just to cheaply develop our national ideas. And after all these adventures, in 1523 we finally create the most powerful European Empire, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Only as usual, I don't remember if these ideas are better for conquest or not. We'll check soon. This is what Polish ideas look like, and this is what the Commonwealth's ideas are. Now it's essentially your choice. If I cared about army quality, I would choose Polish ideas, as they are better in this aspect than those of the Commonwealth. But honestly, I don't plan to just sit back and do nothing. I want to conquer and prepare this country to dominate the world. Therefore, I choose the ideas of the Commonwealth, which are simply better for this purpose. We save a lot of points by reducing the cost of ideas. We get monthly administrative power plus one. And this isn't just a ruler bonus, it's an extra amount we receive. Of course, it costs us 25% of our manpower, but in the build I'm presenting, that shouldn't be a problem. I add all newly acquired territories to states to implement our full administration. I can afford this because the Commonwealth is an empire. A great trick before the end of an era is to do something specific. On new territories, I've increased taxes, reduced autonomy everywhere, and now we're exploiting the whole country for administrative development. This is because all modifiers that increase taxation affect the amount of gold gained from this decision. I might do this in three years. Hmm, maybe it's time to change the terms of the Pacta Conventa. Quite nice. But but what did I choose? I can't remember. I can't see the new national decision, although that's probably what it's about. Well, I need to gather 60% of the crown land again. I also got new Casas Belly as the Commonwealth, which will allow me to conquer the entire Balkans. But I won't use it, as I have better options. I develop diplomatic ideas quickly in Poland, which will be needed for our next conquests. The Reformation era is here. For Poland, the Polish crown is the most important, followed by religious wars. Since it's a good time to further develop our economy, I focus 
focus mainly on building the remaining workshops, especially in Lithuanian territories, and then, of course, on constructing manufactories. I continue reclaiming territories in the Balkans. Initially, these will be territories for Byzantium. The worst part of conquering the Balkans is dealing with Ottoman rebels. Meanwhile, I keep extracting resources from the Mamluks or Moscow. Here, I am not conquering. I'm waiting for Russia to form. Somehow, conquering them is more satisfying. Finally, the Polish crown. This allows Poland to become Europe's granary. Russia has finally formed and we can conquer it after taking the last provinces from Venice as they have our Balkans. The Venetian army is not a problem for Poland. I'm puzzled if Riga, upon becoming a vassal, automatically gains 10 development. It had 16 before vassalization, now it's 29. When you have such powerful armies that you can defeat two armies of around 40,000 with just one of 30,000. It's amazing how easily the Commonwealth can dominate everyone nearby. That moment when rebels cause you to lose Lose your capital but keep other provinces. Herdur, Husaria is coming, let's keep fighting the Venetians. Is that even the right conjugation? After occupying the Balkans, I focused on permanently integrating Hungary into the Commonwealth, which will take a very long time. After our Balkan conquests, a coalition formed against Poland. Meanwhile, in the north, the Kingdom of Denmark started conquering Swedish territories. It will be interesting to see how this story unfolds. After taking most of Anatolia, my next target will be conquering Mamluk provinces, mainly those with monuments. Poland is experiencing a true cultural flourish. Strangely, for some reason, I'm building a market in Riga for the fifth time. Why does it keep getting destroyed? There's a new good ruler, but sadly the same doesn't support his policies. I don't know if there's a connection, but every time I have a ruler with good stats, the same is against him. It's 1558, and we control several very rich trade areas. I could send everything to the Baltic, but a lot of trade is escaping from Hungary. I'm not worried about trade in Constantinople. Here, it's enough that Byzantine influence starts to increase, and our influence will grow too. We had a dispute with Russia over the border, so now I'll conquer a lot from them. I'm not going to build fences between us, right? Oops, I think I broke Russia. Poland also contributed to the rebirth of a certain empire. From that moment, we have an eternal friendship with the Byzantine Empire. When did I get these tributaries? It's high time to start developing our trading companies, so our commonwealth can earn even more and gain additional merchants. It's time to shift our focus to administrative aspects. From now on, our expansion, especially towards India, will be significant. I might wait until the full development of administrative ideas. Oh yeah, I could revoke the Pacta Conventa privilege, but I'm worried it might prevent a civil war event, as we need this hidden modifier as Poland. I am unsure if revoking the privilege will remove the modifier. There's nothing about this on wiki, but I've been misled by it before. Only the privilege should disappear, but I feel uneasy about removing it, so I'll leave it this time. If anyone has tested this, please let me know in the comments. Meanwhile, let's focus on developing our trading companies. The Anatole and Levantine ones are operational, and now I'm working on the Crimean. The Cossacks have started a small rebellion. Historically, this didn't end well for Poland, but we'll manage with our strong army. Where's the Husaria? I forgot about them. Let's add some. We've expanded the market in Karakov, giving us two additional traders, which is very powerful. Let's build more regiment camps, mainly in our personal unions, to prepare for upcoming wars. Denmark is doing well in its Scandinavian conquests. I might take advantage of that. Before 1600, we need to acquire two important monuments in Malta and Granada. So... It's time for a little war. Looking at how easily we're dealing with the French armies, it's so easy that I can't even show you anything. Oh, a university, let's build it. We're defeating the French army. Almost, not quite so much, and we push to the south. France will pay us a good tribute. I wanted to attack Denmark, but now it's leading the Protestant League against the Emperor, so I'll wait. We need to start thinking about controlling the Baltic. We can either conquer all provinces or establish a union. There are many opponents due to their league leadership, so we must wait for the war to end. Preparing for war with Denmark, we need to expand our fleet to 10-15 heavy ships. After conquering this region, I turned all the wool, which was abundant here, into cloth using a mission. It's overpowered with the use of that mission. Out of, I could have waited for a younger ruler as the current one won't live long. Capturing Denmark's capital seems easier than I thought without any battles. It's extremely rare to get a personal union over the Commonwealth in an election, rarer than winning the lottery, but someone did. The event to inherit the Commonwealth is even rarer. The union over Denmark will upset a few, but it's not a big deal. Oh, that was a bloody war. Nice, I have claims on all of Scandinavia. 
It's the era of absolutism and the moment of truth. Although I see a certain symbol that has appeared. Yes, we have it, a Polish civil war. So if you want to achieve it, you know what you have to do. Wow, time flies. A struggle for royal power, tensions between the emperor and the same have reached a critical point. The emperor has become a nearly intolerant of the perpetual need to compromise with the slakta in order to accomplish even the most minor act of governance. I'm starting a war with the nobility. If the rebels win, we'll become an elective monarchy. It seems we already are. No changes here, but we won't let the magnates win. We're fighting them near Lublin. Yes, this is our new capital. Don't ask me why. I won't lie. These rebellions have cost me. I've lost about 200 golden income. Okay, we have the opposite of the Polish golden crown and these rebellions plus 20. Oh my god, this is a very long list of rebellions. As Poland, we can only have minus 88 points of absolutism. Let's cancel some of these privileges. Let's send our troops all over the country because we're clearly going to have a lot of rebellions. You can see it on this map, right? Three years later, a confederacja was formed. Just as August VI has resolved to remove power from the same, so has the same made its own demands to the August VI. I will not negotiate with usurpers. We oppose them. The confederacja will never rule. Following the establishment of a confederacja demanding the dethronement of the emperor, rebel nobles have risen up in open rebellion against the crown. The Sandomir's Rokosh. I won't negotiate with them either. The same was pacified. This allowed me to get rid of troublesome privileges and stabilize the situation in Poland. Finally, I can govern this country in peace. The emperor triumphs. All that's left is to complete this mission. Okay, to gain as much absolutism as possible, we need to conquer a lot, unless we want to be a theocracy? The transformation of this nation's government is unconstitutional and unlawful. We demand the restoration of a constitutional monarchy. It's even funny because the nobility has just transformed into a new social class. Politicians, they just disappeared. Now I have total control over the lands. I'm still checking, but it seems so. We only need 60 absolutism. Well, I have a lot of overextension. I mean, a little, but we need it. Now we should have special rebellions, unless my country is too stable. Oops, so let's conquer some more. Oh, they're here now. And now, in so many provinces, we'll gain autonomy. What a beautiful sight. This should also reduce our maximum absolutism. White peace taken. And now, more importantly, we do one thing. We lower autonomy everywhere. By doing this, we will gain absolutism. It used to be gained faster. Very quickly, five years later, we overthrow the Polish Golden Liberty. This allows me to introduce the Polish autocratic monarchy. It's an incredibly powerful form of government, perfect for world conquest. And now I can make an even bigger mistake and introduce a constitution. But since our republic has just 3,000 development, 4,000 with vassals, that's 100% war conquest. The biggest country is four wars. Although, no, correction, France is bigger. It's also four wars. And we still don't have maximum absolutism. So as you can see, the absolute monarchy for the republic, it's the dream government for conquest. And if it's about conquests and dealing with their consequences, I recommend this episode with the Czechs, in which I, as the Czechs, must survive a coalition of literally all of Europe. Because with the Czechs, I conquered all of Germany in less than 50 years.